everyone, this is David DeBeau, publisher of the Fast Track Inner Circle, here with another one of our monthly audio CD success interviews. And this month, I have the pleasure of interviewing Canadian personal financial guru and TV personality, Gail Vazoxley. Gail, how are you doing today? I'm doing really well. That's great. Now, over the last decade, Gail has written 10 books on personal finance, published a financial magazine for women, hosted and co-produced a primetime personal financial TV show, and worked with Canada's leading financial services companies to help educate their employees and clients. Gail is one of Canada's most successful and respected financial writers. She has also been a regular feature writer for the Globe and Mail, Chatelaine Magazine, Money and Forum. Originally born in Jamaica, Gail immigrated to Canada in 1977 for God knows what reason, Gail. <laughs> Well, there was a fair amount of political turmoil in Jamaica at the time. The island was pretty well boiling. Ah, I see. And so a lot of us ran for the hills. Ah, I see. And Canada looked like a, a good choice for you. Perhaps it's been a great choice. It has, yes. I, I, I say that tongue-in-cheek because I spent uh, 10 years in Costa Rica myself, and when people find out that I came back, they they want to smack me upside the head. Well, the thing is, is that a lot of us don't appreciate what a fabulous standard of living we have here and how much opportunity there is here. That's very, very true. Now, personally, Gail, I enjoy watching your show till debt do us part on TV very much, and I really like your no BS style. You you don't pull any punches. Uh, <laughs> I seen... try not to. I think that I think that honesty is probably the commodity that is. Um, most essential in this. Yes. And so I tend to lay things on the table pretty well as they are. Right. Now, seeing that everyone on the call that's listening to our call today, uh, Gail, is interested in becoming wealthy, you know, I thought you'd be the perfect uh, person to interview today. <laughs> and just to kind of give you a little bit of a background, Gail, I'm sure you're you're familiar with Robert Kiyosaki and the whole rich dad poor dad sure. thing. Our group of people were Canadianizing. Robert Kiyosaki's message and bringing it here to Canada and making it applicable here in Canada. And that's what uh, Darren Weeks, my business partner, does. He speaks across the country trying to uh, help elevate the financial IQ of Canadians. Right. So I think a lot of us have a problem with consumer debt, and that's where you definitely are, are an expert. So, um, yeah, I guess we'll just get right into the questions. Great. Now, how did you first become interested in finances in the first place? I used to be a consultant, a management training consultant, mm -hmm. and one of the projects that I got was to create educational material for a financial institution to teach them what an RSP was and how to sell it. And so I wrote self-paced material, and it worked so well, we decided to do it for every single product the financial institution sold. So I did that, and then did it again, and I did it again, and I did it again. And by then, I had seen every single product being sold to the financial services sector and had the unique perspective in terms of not only dealing with one product in a great deal of detail, but seeing them all and how they all dovetail together. So I saw credit, and I saw investments, and I saw insurance. And that gave me a sort of an unusual perspective. Interesting. Well, that uh, that explains how you got into it in the first place, and how well, did you... and very holistically. Yes, you know, uh, not just sort of invest, 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 but I don't really care whether you have any debt or not. It was very holistic. Right. And how did you first kind of uh, click into this massive consumer debt problem that uh, we as Canadians seem to be embroiling ourselves in? And it is. It's a huge problem. Well, what happened was uh, the network Slice that had this idea for a television show, and it, they asked for producers to come and pitch them. And a couple of the producers got in touch with me and said, would you be interested in doing this? And the one that I chose to work with eventually won the contract with Slice, and so they're producing the show for Slice. Um, and that was really my first foray into what's referred to as lifestyle television. Uh -huh. And um, it's been a real eye-opener for me in terms of seeing how TV's made, and I've really enjoyed that whole process. Fantastic. Now, we've all heard about how serious the consumer debt problem is for Canadians. Do you happen to have any stats on just how bad it really is? <laughs> I, I have some stats, uh -oh. and it is really bad. Uh -oh. um, you know, our stats tend to get reported to us um, a little bit behind. Yeah. So I'm going to give you some stats from uh, 1982 to 2001 first. And in that period of time, we have watched our debt just grow so dramatically. 
So in 2001, St- Statistics Canada reported, I'll start that again for you with a pause. In 2001, Statistics Canada reported that about 47% of households in Canada were spending more than their pre-tax income. Wow. Half of Canadians spending more than their pre-tax income. Okay, and that was up from 39% in 1982. And as if that isn't bad enough, since then, the numbers have gone up even further because now we know that more money is being put on lines of credit and credit cards than ever before. In fact, compared to 1999, from 1999 to 2005, um, our line of credit use has gone up 133%. Oh, my goodness. Our credit card installment debt use has gone up almost 60%. We're spending almost 42% more on vehicle loans and 32% on other debt, which can, can be anything from buy now, pay later, to pay advance loans. So as bad as things were before, they are worse now. It's, it sounds like we're heading towards a crisis. Well, it, there's no doubt in my mind when I look at the families that I'm working with that even a small increase in interest rates will have a significant effect on their ability to continue making their payments. Because as it is, people are falling further and further behind. One of the reasons why the crisis has not hit yet is because credit has been so accessible that people keep being sent new forms of credit. And they're using those new forms of credit to continue making their minimum payments on their existing debt. So they actually cannot pay their debt from their cash flow, but because they're being granted more and more credit, they're using credit to pay credit. That, that is amazing. Now It is amazing. You know, I know that my parents and my grandparents were real savers. They always saved up to buy things and paid cash for practically everything. David, they had to. They had no credit. <laughs> there you go. Okay. That was the problem. So credit cards didn't come to Canada until 1965. Okay, so it's only been since 1965 that this whole idea of using money you have not yet earned became something that was even a possibility. And that's part of the reason why we're having so much difficulty with it, because it's re- relatively new as an instrument to us. It's relatively new. And it wasn't until the 80s that lines of credit were being sold to consumers. Usually credit was granted. You had to prove yourself able to pay it back. And then in 1980s, there was this big about face and financial institutions started selling credit as a commodity. And so that is why we're in such deep doo-doo. So basically, if I understand you correctly, is it's it's just the ease of getting credit that has thrown everything so out of whack for these younger or younger generations. Absolutely. And it's not just the credit that's available here in Canada because credit products are flooding across the border. And so we are using credit being granted from our southern cousins. And part of the problem there is that the rules that apply in the U.S. to U.S. users do not apply to Canadian users. And so what's happening is that we're seeing product come across the border that are phenomenally punitive to use. But because people have no idea the trouble that they're getting themselves into, they're embracing it wholeheartedly. So I've seen credit cards come across the border charging upwards of 38%. When you factor in the fees, My goodness. and those same cards position themselves as being better than the cards being granted by our banks. You know, the hands in your pocket. Ad? Yeah. Mm, <laughs> yes. There you go. And those are those are one of the, that's one of the companies that's charging those outrageous. Because fees. when you add in the fees, which I believe you must, it's all mm. very well and good to say that we have a usury rate of sixty percent in Canada. But we already know that the pay advance industry has gotten around that by using fees instead. And so pay advance stores are charging upwards to a thousand percent interest when you calculate in the fees. So you have to calculate in the fees because people are paying them. Just because they didn't call it interest doesn't mean that they aren't. Yeah, it is not a cost. Good. That's right. So basically, as of 2001, almost 50% of Canadians spent more than they made pre-tax. Pre-tax. <laughs> That's phenomenal. <laughs> and, and it seems like, so, I, so this is, a, this is a, an incredibly huge national problem, 
but it, it is seems a like, national problem. You know, it seems like most would, of us would rather walk down uh, the main street of our town naked than admit that our finances are all screwed up. Why is Absolutely. it so hard for us to own up to the fact that I, we're in such deep doo doo? David, I don't know. I, I cannot imagine why. I, the thing is, is that I'm a high disclosure person. Yeah. And so I just talk to, I'm willing to talk about just about anything. But people are more willing to talk about their sexual positions and who they're making out with than they are talk about how much debt they have. And over and over again, you know, people will apply to go on the show and they will get all the way through the application process and all of a sudden they'll bail. Right because they're afraid of this disclosure. It's one of the reasons I have a great deal of respect for the people that actually come on my show. Yes, they need the help, but they are also brave enough to be able to open themselves up to, you know, potential criticism from their family. I mean, we've had people who have had to pull out because their families have said to them, if you do the show, we'll never talk to you again. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Yeah, so it's pride, basically. That's, that's what it all boils down to, I guess. And pride comes before a fall, because yeah. in reality... If you don't fix this problem, if you know you have a problem that motivates you to make an application to a television show, and then you chicken out at the end, you're actually doing yourself a huge disservice. Because the thing is, is that when are you going to stop spending the money? When are you going to dig yourself out of the hole? Exactly. You know, wise, wise words, that's for sure. So besides having a collection agency actually harassing <laughs> you, how does someone know if they're in a credit crisis or not? Well, you know, there are a whole bunch of things. I referred to one before. When you're using credit to pay credit, yeah. you know you have a problem. Um, if you find you, you're writing checks for uh, the amount that's greater than the amount you have left in your bank account, you know you have a problem. That, that um, translates to be calling, called a rubber check, I believe. Is that that's good? right. It bounces all over the place. Boing, yeah. boing, boing. Um, if you constantly apply for more credit because your credit is at its limit you have a problem. If you're borrowing money from your family, from your friends, from your coworkers, if you're taking an advance on your salary, you know you have a problem. Uh, and, you know, if you can't meet your basic expenses, if you're starting to put your food on your credit card for anything other than convenience, then you have a problem. How about payday loans? Hate them. Yeah. The thing is, is that very often... The people who go, and this is part of the reasons why I, I hate this product so much. People who go there feel like they have no other alternatives. And I'll give you an example, okay? Yeah. I worked with a couple who uh, were living, they had some debt, and they were living paycheck to paycheck. And their daughter had an accident, and they had to take time off work to take their child to the hospital and to care for their child until the crisis had passed. They couldn't make their mortgage payment without going to a pay advance store because they didn't have access to credit in the traditional means because they already used it all up. Yeah. So it pushed them even further. But the rates are so rapacious that there was no way for them to ever get out of it again. Okay? And that's the problem with going to those places. I mean, they, you know, short of breaking your legs, they break your soul. Yes. And ultimately, there's no way to get out of it. Well, I guess there must be a way to get out of it because that's... Uh... That's what I do. That's what you do. That's yeah. what you were doing on TV. So Well, you know, I pull people's belts so tight that they squeak. That's the first thing, okay? Well, I've seen that. I've seen your, your first day, and you've got your jars out there, and, you know, you're, you're divvying up stuff, and, and it comes down to food, and they end up, you know, there's a family of five, and they've got $25 <laughs> this week to buy food. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? Last week, I worked with a couple where I took all their money away from them. I made them give away all the money in their jars to bring home the point that you cannot live on money you have not yet earned. Wow. Okay, and I said to them, go through your couch, <laughs> check your pants pockets, find whatever change you have because you don't have this money anymore. And, of course, I have their debit cards and I have their credit cards, so they can't actually access their accounts. Wow. And they found $165 in change around their house. And I said to her at, when we did our checkup, I said, so... You did good, and she said, "Yeah." And I have eighty-six dollars of it left. She spent. I, she said, "I spent a dollar ninety-nine on food this week." <laughs> well, because well, you're digging into the bottom of the freezer. I That's guess. right. Yeah. And the thing is, is that you know what? I've had to live on tuna and craft dinner. Okay, yeah. I know it is not the nicest thing in the whole world to do, but if that's what you have to do to make ends meet until you get out of the crisis, that's what you do. And of course, the other thing I do is I say to people, "Get another job." You do. 
Yeah, well, you know what? They're 24 hours in a day. Right. So you can work harder or you can work smarter. You can decide. And that may mean upgrading your career. It may mean just going out and getting another job. Find a way to make more money. You know, people like to walk dogs or um, cut their friend's hair. Or I mean, there are a bazillion ways to make some more money. And if that's what you have to do to dig yourself out of the hole, that's what you do. Suck it up and work harder. I guess. I mean, we're watching, I, I heard on average, four hours of TV a day. That uh, that could be replaced with a part-time job. That's for absolutely. Sure. Yeah. And if that's what's getting you towards your goal, then it should be worthwhile. Excellent, excellent advice. Okay, Gail, you've, you've broken me. I, I realize it. I, I admit it. I'm walking down the street <laughs> naked. I admit I'm in a credit <laughs> crisis. So now, what do I do? Well, the first thing you have to do is you have to get the debt paid off. And the only way you're going to get the debt paid off is to first of all figure out what you need to spend. So you have to make a budget. Ooh, okay? the, the B word. B word, yeah. Sometimes I tell people it's a spending plan. You're going to uh, spend the money anyway. You might as well have a plan. Mm -hmm. But it boils down to budget. And I think the number one question I get from people as I'm out doing my own shopping is, how do you decide how much money to put in the jars? <laughs> right, right. Yeah. So I went ahead and created this website that has the budget that I use on it, so people can build themselves a budget now, and the budget automatically pours the money into the jars so that people can see how to use the jars themselves. But basically what you have to do is you have to figure out how to cut back on what you're spending so you don't spend more money than you make. And you also have to figure out how to pay your debt off so that it's not dragging around your neck for the next 30 years. And so I tell people you have to have this debt paid off within three years. If you don't have it paid off within three years, you're going to suffer from something called debt fatigue. Debt and fatigue? Debt fatigue. Yeah. And that's when you reach the point where you say, well, I'm always going to be living in debt, so what difference is it to me? I'll just keep spending because there is no hope. Okay, so just speaking of, of debt, now you've done quite a few of your shows, and typically you're dealing with you know normal middle-class Canadian families, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, they're fairly typical. What's in your experience, been kind of the average debt load that they're carrying? Oh, there like, is like no the average system. debt load. There isn't okay, any. there is no average debt load. I've seen people, I've seen a couple with an income of $3,500 a month with access to $100,000 worth of credit through a variety of credit cards. Can you believe it? Yes, unfortunately I can. Yeah. Okay. And I've seen people with as little as $20,000 but with no idea how to get it paid off because their spending is so out of whack that they can't find the money to pay down the debt. Right. Okay? And so it really isn't a question of um, how much debt do you have. It's really a question of well, how much money are you spending? Because over and over again I cut people's budgets. I'll cut their budget by 60%. I'll right. cut their budget by 80%. And they will tell me at the end of four weeks they still have money left in the jars. And I say, how can you have money left in the jars when I cut back on your budget so much? They say, because they're paying attention now. Right. So I just finished working with a couple who not only had money left in the jars, they had enough money to buy me a present. <laughs> <laughs> they That's bought nice me the price. most beautiful shovel. And they lithographed it to say, thank you for helping us dig ourselves out of debt. <laughs> it was fabulous. That is excellent. So, just uh, Gail, just for the folks that haven't seen your show yet, and I'm sure they'll be watching it after this call, what are the jars that you have people set up? Well, there's a jar for food. Yeah. There is a jar for entertainment, a jar for transportation. And these are variable expenses. So these are the cash that you usually load. So the transportation jar, for example, is only gas and repairs. The payment that you would make to your car company would be on the fixed expenses because it's a regular expense. Right, okay. Okay, so food, entertainment, transportation, clothing and gifts, and then there is an other jar, and the other jar includes miscellaneous things like uh, if you have pets or your medical and dental and optometrist costs your bank fees, that sort of stuff. So anything that doesn't fall under the first four categories gets slid into other. All right. And so those are all variable uh, expenses? Those are all variable expenses. And mm -hmm. very often I have chopped gobs and gobs out of their variable expenses. So, you know, I say I'm sorry. 
you can't afford the gym. What makes you think if you have debt, you can afford to go to the gym? Mm-hmm. You can start walking the mall, or you can start jogging on the street. or you better, know. T- better keep them out of the mall, Gail. <laughs> <laughs> In the morning, before the mall opens. <laughs> because, you know, a lot of seniors do that. Right. They walk the mall in the wintertime. Um, and so I will chop back on all sorts of things. I will cut back on their transportation costs. And I will say, you only have $112 a week for transportation costs. So, you know, think twice before you decide you're going to drive all over Hell's Half Acre for whatever entertainment you think you're going to go and do. Right. Because they aren't going to have all that much more money for entertainment anyway, right? No, you're not. And so very often you have to come up with lots of free ways to entertain yourself. Right. And the thing is, is that when people stop going out to eat, when they start staying home and cooking at home because they're on a budget, they find that they're spending more quality time together. Mm-hmm. You know, so they're sharing their the stuff that people do as a natural part of life. You're doing it slow enough, and you're enjoying it more together. So you can't afford to go out and spend gobs of money um, buying theater tickets. But maybe what you do is you get together and you join a theater group and you work together as part of the the stage crew, right? Mm-hmm. So you get to meet people and have a great time, but you're not spending money doing it. Right, right. Uh, makes, so you're actually bringing families closer together by... Uh, Hopefully, because yeah. a, big par- a big component of this is always their relationship. Right. And very often, money creates problems in relationships. And this, so isn't that the biggest cause of divorce? It is the biggest cause of yeah. divorce. But you know what, David? Sometimes the relationship causes the problems with the money. So what happens is because the relationship is rocky, people are doing the oddest things to each other. They're, maybe they're gambling. Maybe they're out partying. Um, they're, they're destroying the financial aspect of their life because the relationship's bad. And so sometimes I have to fix the relationships first. And then having fixed that, then we can apply with the money. Did you know you're going to be getting yourself into that when, uh, when you first agreed to get had on the show? no <laughs> idea. But you know what? I'm good at it. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> I see that, yeah. Because I've seen on the show, I've seen quite often you've got two people with completely different concepts about money or, yes. or spending patterns or, you know, uh, the the one I hear a lot is, hey, I could be hit by a bus tomorrow, so you got to live it up while you can. That's right. I hear mm-hmm. that all the time. I mean, I met one young lad who thought that gambling was a great way to win a million dollars. And I said to him, you know, if you take X number of dollars and you put it away for the 45 years that you have till you retire, because he was young, okay, you will have your million dollars. And he said, 45 years? I could be dead by then. Mm-hmm. You know, but it doesn't take a lot of money to acquire a good asset base when you start young enough. Right. I mean, you may only have to put away five or six percent of your income if you start when you're 20 or 22 years old. But wait until you're 40 or 45 years old and watch how much income has to be eaten up by savings because you didn't start early enough. If you put compounding to work for you, man, you're laughing. You're starting to make me sweat now, girl. <laughs> well, you know what? When I was in my early 20s, I wanted a fur coat, okay? I could actually taste the fur coat, and I would not spend my money on the fur, on the fur coat because I thought it was such a huge, oh, like how could you waste money on that? Yeah, but I really it. wanted one. Yeah. So you know what I did? I started contributing to an RSP, and I put the money in the RSP, and then when I got the tax refund back, I used that to build the fund for the fur coat because I wasn't spending my money. I was just going to spend the money the government was going to piss away anyway. Uh huh. Right? right? So I was totally justified at that point. <laughs> and so you can play games with yourself like this. You know, people have money set points in their lives. They, they save $10,000 and they think, I'm safe. Okay? And I say to them, hide the $10,000 and start a new fund. So now you're working at building your next $10,000. Right. Right, exactly. And that's a really great game to play with yourself, if you have to play a game with yourself, in order to never get sort of complacent about how much money you have. Good advice. Very, very good advice. All right, Gail. Well, kind of getting back to that big bad B word, the budget, why do you think it's such a hard thing for most people to get their head around? First of all, people perceive a budget to be very inflexible. Uh-huh. They put money in categories And then when something happens and pushes them out of their range, their financial range, 
they feel like they've blown their budget, and so this budget thing doesn't work. Hmm. Okay? But that's not what a budget is. As I said before, a budget is a plan for how you're going to spend your money. But plans need to be flexible enough to change. And so one of the questions I often get from couples when I give them their jars is, can I move money between the jars? And I say, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Because the fact is, what you cannot do is spend more money than you make. That's what you cannot do. That's against the rule. Okay? But if you want to take your entertainment money and put it in your food jar, feel free. If you want to take some money out of transportation and put it in your gifts jar because this month you have four birthdays that you have to cover, go ahead. Go crazy. Okay? Just take the bus that month. That's what you do. Or walk. Right. Okay? You need to know it's your money and you get to spend it the way you want to spend it, but you can't spend more money than you make. Because when you spend money you have not yet earned, you run the risk that when it comes time to earn that money, you may not be earning that money. You may be sick. You may be taking care of an ill Ill child. You may be facing some other kind of crisis. And then you have two stresses, the stress that you're dealing with plus the stress of the fact that you have debt you accumulated before that you now can't afford to pay back. Yes. So the way to have a happy, balanced life is to keep things in balance. And that's what a budget is. A budget is balancing the money you make with the money you spend. And being flexible within that as long as you're not spending more than you make. Absolutely. And Mm -hmm. so, you know, um, you need to save some money. You need to have some money set aside for emergencies. You need to be actively paying down your debt. And then after you've accumulated those amounts in your budget categories, feel free to disperse the rest of the money any way you want. Yeah, so that gives, gives people a few more options there. That's great. Exactly. Okay, so we've, you know, we've admitted we're in a crisis, uh, we've, we've got our jars together, we've put together a, a budget, um, we're starting to live within that, and again, I highly recommend anybody who hasn't seen your show, they watch it a few times, or as often as, as possible, because it's, it's really good, it's very practical, hands-on ways to deal with your debt. I think that's one of the things that has surprised me the most about the show, is how many people are watching it and saying to me that they are learning from it. You know, people are telling me that they're taping it and then watching it again and again because they have this sense that they have things to learn from it. And I get letters from all over the world. Um, Malaysia, Australia, people who have used the tips and techniques I've delivered on the show and have used them to get themselves out of trouble. Oh, that's fantastic. Now, for those who haven't uh, seen the show that are on the call, what are some of your rules of thumb when it comes to debt repayment? So paying off that, that huge debt, debt that we're carrying, our consumer debt. Well, first of all, one of the things you have to do is make sure you have enough money so that you're paying off the debt. Uh, sometimes people's cash flows are such that their needs, not just their wants, but their actual needs are eating up almost all the money that they make. And so maybe that means you have to go out and get a second job. You have to work harder or you have to work smarter or maybe you have to get a third job. Okay, you have to find the money it'll take to repay the debt. And then you have to decide which debts to pay off first. Mm -hmm. So now, you know, people say, is there a rule? And I say there are no rules. It all depends on what works for you. Some people like to pay off their most expensive debt first, and that's my first choice. Mm -hmm. But some people like to get rid of the small bills and get them out of the way. So they don't have nine debts anymore. No, they just have four that they're working on. Right. And if that's going to motivate you, then you know what? Whatever floats your boat. <laughs> okay? Yeah. You also have to look for ways to reduce your interest costs. So either you consolidate using a line of credit or an installment loan or go and negotiate with your different creditors and say to them, listen, I am this close to bankruptcy. Okay? Mm-hmm. You can push me over the edge or you can help me pay you back. My best intention is to pay you back, so help me do this. And they will do things like reduce your interest rate or eliminate the interest and ask you just to repay the principal, okay? And make sure you're always paying at least the minimum so you don't end up ruining your credit history because if you do wreck your credit history, your interest costs will go up. You will pay more interest because you are a bad risk. All right. Okay, well, that kind of... Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Do you have any other any other rules of thumb for debt repayment? Well, I don't think a lot of people, I don't think most people need more than two sources of credit. Okay. Okay. 
um, one that you use regularly and one for a backup just in case. Because, for instance, there are places you will go that will not take your form of credit. Right. So, so I when say, you say two forms of credit, you mean two, like two credit cards. Two credit cards, basically, yeah. yeah. Um, so I say to people, like, if you have 12 credit cards, why? Right. Narrow it down to two, pay them off, and get rid of them. Okay? And if you have any store cards at all, you're dumb, 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 because okay. they charge the most interest. Right. The other thing you can do is I... I have credit cards, and I use my credit cards religiously, but I use my credit cards as convenience cards. Mm -hmm. So what I do is, uh, let's say I go out today and I buy some gas. I open up my checkbook register, and I put in gas, and then I put in $45, and I deduct it out of my checkbook register. So I know I have already spent that money, so I am not tempted to spend it again. Okay? So I'm almost using my credit card like a check. Then when my bill comes in, I compare my statement to all those charges that I made, and I write the check number or the transaction number if I'm paying by telephone or by internet. Uh, beside all of those things, that way, if something I have charged has not come through on my statement, again, I'm not tempted to spend the money twice. Right. Okay, because I've already got it deducted out of my bank statement. Smart. Smart. Very good. And I've been doing this since I was about 20. Well, you're, you're way ahead of the rest of us, that's for sure, Gail. Well, you know what? I hate debt. Yeah. I can't sleep at night, David. If I have debt hanging over me, if there's something that I have not paid for some reason, like I can't sleep at night. I don't understand why you would put yourself through that because there are lots of people that I meet that say that. They aren't sleeping. Well, you know what? Stop being so much in denial. Don't be an ostrich. Get your head out of the sand and do something about it. Right. Right. And that is, you know, pride and denial. I think those those are the two factors that uh, affect most people when it comes to debt. That's for sure. Now, playing the devil's advocate, Gail, say, so I figure out I'm in a crisis. Um, you know, things are way out of whack. Why shouldn't I just declare bankruptcy and start fresh? Why stress out about paying back my debt so much? Well, you know what? You can go ahead and declare bankruptcy if you want assuming they'll even let you, because the rules have gotten tighter recently in terms oh. of your bankruptcy. Um, and when you do declare bankruptcy, they're going to put you on the amount of money that they say you should have and put all the rest towards your debt, so you lose control of how you manage your money. And then you have a crappy credit history for the next nine years or seven years, um, because you are what's classified as an R9 and that R9 means that nobody's ever going to want to lend to you. And if you ever do get to borrow money, you will be paying the highest possible interest because you're such a bad risk. Mm -hmm. So those are all the reasons why you shouldn't declare bankruptcy. Well, that's, that's, <laughs> those are some pretty good reasons there. However, perhaps the one that is most significant, uh -huh. and it's why people come to me, it's because, you know what? You made this mess. You should clean it up. Right. There are people that I do recommend bankruptcy for. For example, I worked with one woman who had started a small business, and the small business did not work. And it was repaying that debt was so hard for her that she couldn't do it. She couldn't get another job. There was no way out. So all it meant was that she was just going to keep shuffling the debt around, and that's no answer either. Right. And so I said to her, you know what? Bankruptcy was made for you. Right. And she did not want to go bankrupt. Here's the funny thing, right? She actually did not want to do it, and so I sent her to our trustee bankruptcy, and he explained the implications to her, and in the end, she decided that, in fact, was the best route for her. Because ultimately, you have to be able to do this. You have to be able to start fresh if you're going to have any kind of life at all. And those are the people for whom bankruptcy were created, was created. The bankruptcy rules were created. Um, there is a couple I have just recently started to work with, and bankruptcy would be the easiest way out for them. And we have decided that that is not an appropriate response, that they will do whatever is necessary to meet their commitments so that they can you know, hold their heads up and go forward with, with some pride. I think that's, I think that's huge. I, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, if, you're, you know, if you've really gone for it and you've tried to start a business and it hasn't worked for whatever reason, um, yeah, that's one thing. But if you've created this mess for yourself just because you've been buying Gucci bags and stereos and what have you and racking it up all on your credit cards and eating out time all the time. Time to pay the piper. 
It's yeah, exactly. It's time yeah. to you know own up to it and face up to it and change your ways and take responsibility. Absolutely. Right. Okay. Now, Gail, say I have a slightly how shall we put it tarnished <laughs> credit history. I've got a few little blemishes there. Uh, you've convinced me that my uh, bankruptcy really is a last resort. It, it shouldn't be what I do. What are some good ways to get my credit back on track? My Here's the credit. thing. The mm-hmm. only way to get a good credit history is to use credit wisely. Okay. okay? So now I'm going to tell you, you have to go and borrow some money. So take out a loan and make an investment. Okay? Mm-hmm. The perfect example is to borrow money for an RRSP. Okay. Okay. Use your tax refund to pay down the loan and make sure you get that loan paid off well before the 12 months. If you take 12 months to pay back that loan, what it means is that next year you're going to have to borrow your RSP contribution again. Right. Okay. But if you make the commitment to, to using this to repay your loan quickly and build a good credit history and you want to continue making RSP contributions, then what you do is you pay off that loan in six months and then you use the next six months to start making your next contribution so that you get ahead of the game. All right. Okay? The other thing you can do is if you have someone who really loves you, because I'm telling you, if you're the co-signer, I'm telling you not to do this. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) But if you can find someone who will co-sign for you or guarantee it, then borrow, let's say, $1,000 and stick it in a GIC or a term deposit, rather, for 60 or 90 days and then pay it back. And what you'll do is you'll start establishing a credit history. Okay? The other thing you can do if all else fails is you can get what's called a secured credit card. Uh-huh. And with a secured credit card, you put down an amount on deposit that's usually double the amount of credit that you have access to. So if, for example, you want a credit card with a $1,000 balance or with $1,000 worth of credit available, then you'd have to put $2,000 down on deposit. That way your credit card is secured. There's no risk to the lender. You use that credit card on a regular basis, pay it back on time, reestablish your credit history. Right. Okay. And how long does that usually take if you're you know, really deep in due to? You know, um, I would say nine months worth of transactions probably cleans up your credit history really nicely. Really? Well, that's yeah. very fast, really. Yeah, it is very fast. It's mm-hmm. amazing how, um, and, and that is in a current credit environment, okay? If money gets tight, you know that little blip we had in the credit market recently? Yeah. And money shrank. It was not as accessible. Then it becomes harder to get, get credit. But in the environment that we're in today, it would take you about nine months to clean it up. Very good, very good. Now, Gail, you say that people should not use a credit repair company. Oh, don't waste your money and your time. Those people can't do anything for you. (laughs) I mean, only lazy people do that. People think that, you know, I don't want to take the time. Well, it's your credit. You clean it up. Because, in fact, credit bureaus do not allow other people to act on your behalf. Um, And so anybody who claims that they can find a loophole to fix this problem for you is lying. So if I understand you correctly, you're basically saying if you hire a credit repair company, they're going to make you do all this stuff you can do on your own anyhow they're going to, exactly. and charge you for it. They're just going to tell you what to do and then charge you for it. So you might as well just listen to what I'm saying. It's free. <laughs> do what I say. Excellent. Excellent advice. Okay, Gail. So a, a little while ago, you said that the idea of debt keeps you awake at night if you're in mm-hmm. debt. But then again, you say that not all debt is bad debt. So for you, what's the difference between good debt and bad debt? Uh, Good debt is debt that ultimately will allow you to build assets. So, for example, a student loan, which then translates into a better job, more income, lets you build assets. Um, An investment loan lets you build assets. A mortgage lets you build assets. Buying a new pair of shoes on a credit card does nothing for your future (laughs) assets, and therefore you probably shouldn't spend that money on credit. Right. Right. Okay. So there we have it. So anything that's that's moving you forward, either in your career or your investments or real estate holdings, that's good debt. Bad debt. And anything that's just a drain on your budget. Mm-hmm. That's bad debt. I think we call that in in our language here with the Rich Dad organization a doodad. (laughs) 
Yep. Okay. And what are what are some good reasons to borrow? You kind of touched on them, but do you have any? Yep. Other you know, if you want to borrow money to start building a an investment portfolio or a retirement plan, that's a good reason to borrow money. Mm-hmm. As I said, you want to pay that back as quickly as possible. Otherwise, what happens is you get into the trap where you're always borrowing to make yeah. your contribution, and then you're paying interest. So ultimately, if you can um, borrow the first time and get you into it, and then you can use your tax refund to pay down your debt and pay off your debt quickly, then you start making your contributions regularly. Um, If you are helping your kids to get a great education, that is very good debt because one of the things that you want to do is you want to give them the, the groundwork so that they can make better than minimum wage for the rest of their lives. Um, but you know, good, if good you luck are, getting paid back on it, though. Well, <laughs> this, here's the thing, you know. Very often, people go out and they they go to school and they rack up all this student debt. I blogged this on my website just recently. Uh-huh. Um, they rack up all this debt and they get a a degree in ancient Chinese history and become a bus driver, <laughs> which is a good job, but that's not what the student debt was for. Right. Okay. So you have to put some practicality into this as well. I mean, I received, after I blogged this whole thing about being very sensible about how you do your student loans, I got a woman who responded that said, you know what, I worked, I found ways to pay off my student um, tuition and living fees while I was at school, I acquired no debt getting my education, and I sort of went, hurrah, finally, somebody who's saying that it can be done. Oh, and this was relatively recently, she did. Yes, like okay. in the last few days. Awesome. Awesome. That is great. Uh, I guess we would probably agree another good reason to borrow is if you're building your own business. Absolutely, because, you know, if you have to acquire inventory or if you have to acquire equipment that you need to do your job, then borrowing makes sense. But it's an investment because it's something that's going to increase your ability to earn an income. Now, when I say that, there are people out there who start businesses that think that that gives them an excuse to go out and buy every toy under the sun, okay, for their new business. And that's not sensible either. You have to be able to pay for that from cash flow. So if you have a business and you are extending yourself to the point where it is impacting on your family life and you're not generating any kind of real revenue, then you're just playing a fool's game. So, for instance, I worked with one woman who had over $100,000 worth of debt for her business and was not pulling an income from the business because she simply couldn't afford to. And I said to her, I'm sorry, you don't have a job, you have a hobby. Mm -hmm. Okay? An expensive one. A very expensive one. And subsequently, uh, another woman that I knew personally had watched that show, and she called me aside and she said to me, you know, I watched that show and I cried. And I said, why? Why did you cry? And she said, I haven't taken an income from my business in two years. And once I watched the show, I realized what I was doing wrong. Uh, She closed the business and got a job. It's tough to do, but... It is tough to do, but you know what? Ultimately, you have to ask yourself why you're in this. Yes, you're in this for satisfaction, and satisfaction is worth something. Is satisfaction worth going twenty, thirty, forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars in debt? Is satisfaction worth putting your family at risk? And if the answer to those questions is no, then you'd suck it up and you say, maybe this is not the time. Maybe what I need to do is build an asset base first so that I can give myself the time it takes to build the business to the point where I can actually take an income from it. Excellent. Don't put the cart in front of the horse, in other words. Right, right. Right. Well, Gail, we can definitely tell that you're a very, very smart cookie. <laughs> I'm a chocolate chip. There you go. Really appreciate your time on the call today, Gail. My now, pleasure. for those Inner Circle members who are interested in finding out more about you, what can they do? Go to gailvazoxlade.com. So it's G-A-I-L-V-A-Z-O-X-L-A-D-E.com. And I have a website there that will link to the various places that televise the show so they can watch the show, which is on on Thursday nights at 9 o'clock on Slice TV. Mm -hmm. And that's the two best ways to do this. If you want to read the books, you have to go to the library because my publisher went bust. Oh, I see. Right? And so the place to find the books is in the library, although I will be publishing some online next year. You are a very prolific writer. 
I am a very prolific writer, mostly because it's very easy for me. Uh, because I speak English as opposed to finances, uh-huh. I find it very easy to translate financial stuff into the language that most people need to hear it in. But the interesting thing is, is that I never reached as many people with all the writing that I did as I reached in just the first season with the television show because people like to watch what's going on. And I think it's it's that ability for you to take complex ideas and simplify them for the rest of us that, uh, and your no BS style and your very, very uh, personal approach that has made your, your show such a success. So I congratulate you on that. Thank you very much. All right, you take care. Thank you very much for, for the call today, Okay. Gail, and we'll talk to you soon. All right, take care. Bye-bye.